Good evening, everyone, friends, and welcome once again for this wonderful season of study. And we just want to thank God how he affords us these special privileges in a time like this to still be able to seek his face, to still be able to call him father, to know that he is our elder brother and our special friend. We want to thank God and I want to thank all of you for your support, for your presence, for your prayers, and for your longing to listen to more and more of Jesus. One of the greatest blessings um, over the journey with the Lord is just to see people respond to the gospel. And it is a very, very special gift. And so just want to thank you all for allowing me the privilege to, to see your desire to feast and to spend more time at the feet of the Lord. And so thank you and welcome to tonight's presentation called The Complete Picture. Let us bow our heads as we pray and enter God's presence with thanksgiving in our hearts and let us enter his courts with praise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We want to thank you, Father, not just for what you've been doing, for you've done so much and we've thanked you so little. We also want to take time tonight, Lord, to thank you for who you are. You deserve thanks. We thank you for being God, for being who you are, Lord. You are the Savior. You are the lover of our soul and we just thank you that it is because of you we are able to still breathe, still be able to come thus far and still be able to live. Father, thank you for the mercies you've bestowed, the love you've shown, the compassion that has held us together and has pieced us together as many times when we've been shattered on the floor. Thank you for caring enough, Lord, to put us back together and to send us out to do a special work. I thank you, Father, also for the journey we've been on together. And Lord, it is my humble prayer that your children will go back and refresh the studies we've been having, to go back, refresh their notes, to refresh, oh, Father, through the messages that have been recorded, that they could go back and relive the experience and see the special work God has been doing and the work God wants us to sustain in our lives. We've come, Father, through this sanctuary journey We've seen the wonderful sacrifice and the appeal of Jesus to live the sanctuary life. And I pray, mighty God, that every brother and sister who has joined us tonight and everybody around them may be able to experience the power of the set-apart, sanctified life in the Lord. Thank you once again, Father, for gathering us tonight. And we thank you for the message you have in store for us. And we pray, God, that tonight, not man, but Jesus will be magnified above all names. Thank you for what you are about to do. Thank you, Father, for the chains you're about to break, for love you're about to overwhelm us with. And thank you, Father, for you're about to change our lives. Let glory be given to your name now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening and welcome, friends. Thank you for taking the time to join us. And thank you for the blessing that it is to be a family. And I just want to thank the Lord, like I probably don't know many of you. And yet the joy of knowing that we are coming together as a family and that the Lord is going to do a special thing tonight. And that as we sit at, sit at his feet, we will not go from his presence empty, but rather we will go from his presence filled with the spirit of the Lord. And so I just want to thank you and I pray that you would please pray that these seasons will be seasons where never man, always God is presented before us, always God is magnified before us. I pray that that would be the prayer in your heart so that this never becomes about man, this always becomes about God. I want to give you a little bit of a backdrop to how tonight's message has shaped over the years. Probably several years ago, I asked a friend of mine in, in the group of friends, I asked a friend of mine if, if my friend could share on this, uh, like could share a message. And over a period of time, as I asked my friend what she was intending to share, shared that this particular subject, you know, my friend wanted to share. And, and I had never looked at the subject. And as I went to it and 
I came across a scholar who was talking about who was talking about this particular book rather in the Bible. And I was just so blessed looking at the gospel in this book as, and as the scholar was sharing just mighty points of, of how we see the gospel picture lived out. The Lord has blessed so much because over the years I've shared multiple times, the Lord has helped me see more. It's, it's shaped more. And I've realized that I've never seen this complete a picture of the gospel. Anywhere else in one place, I've not seen it this complete. Put in such powerful words together, like in, in one space, like in just about three verses, if I can be specific, three verses back to back, put in such magnificent fashion. And I'd like us to come to that complete picture and really just praise the Lord tonight for the power of the gospel. And so, friends, I invite you to journey with me with a book. And by the way, we're going to go through this whole book. We're going to spend the, the, our time tonight studying this whole book. That's what, we, that's what we want to study, or at least almost all of it. And it is really powerful. By the way, it is the book of Philemon. The book of Philemon, for those of you who got concerned when I said we're going to go through the whole book, the book of Philemon has one chapter, it has one chapter, 25 verses, very potent theme for our deliberation. Something that's really beautiful is that Philemon then becomes the doorway that ushers us into the very next book that comes after Philemon, which is the book of Hebrews. And you're asking yourself the question, what is so special about the book of Philemon? Why, why would it be allowed for this book to be the doorway, the, the walkway, the, the hallway that ushers us into the book of Hebrews. Because the book of Hebrews is a, is a powerful truth about the priestly ministry of Jesus. And friends, to really appreciate, to appreciate the profundity of, of the truth in Hebrews, it's so powerful that it sets the stage, Philemon sets the stage for us to be able to really go into and see a very, very powerful picture. So we're asking, why would God allow these 25 verses to be the story just before the book of Hebrews, such a powerful book? Why would God allow this? And in this book, we find the answer to that. And it is just, just beautiful. And I really hope that we're all blessed as we study together. I'm starting from Philemon, chapter one and verse one, the Bible says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. The Bible tells us Paul, I really like how he takes joy in being a captive of the love of Jesus. How he would also tell us that it is the love of God that constrains us. It, the, 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 the chains that bind Paul down is the love of Jesus and, and, and just the faithfulness and commitment of Jesus that overwhelms and floods his soul. Paul says, I am a prisoner. I take joy in knowing that I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. What's amazing is Paul is in prison. And as, as, as Paul writes, and he talks about his time in prison, and as he writes this, the, the, this letter, he, it's amazing that he takes joy even in knowing that even when he's confined by four walls, what people may think is he's confined in these four walls, they don't realize they they just give the brother a safe haven. And no matter what situation God's people are in, in their relationship with Jesus, they find that closeness. They find that intimacy with the Lord. And Paul says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Timothy, our brother, and they're, they're joining together as they write to Philemon. And Paul calls him, notice the choice of words, Paul calls him a dearly beloved and a fellow laborer. If we read, in fact, Philemon 1 verse 4, the Bible says, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. In other words, Philemon must have been a person really special to Paul for him to make mention of him every time he prays. And you perhaps could relate to that. There are certain individuals that just come to mind and you may want to pray for them again and again. And the Bible says, the Bible says that 
he says, I thank my God because I make mention of thee always in my prayers. It's such a blessing for me when, when friends and brethren share that, that they've been praying for me. And it's, it's, it's a blessing to know that, that people uphold someone like me up in prayers. And that is, that is such a powerful blessing. Paul also goes on to say, if, you, if you're reading, he, he speaks about Philemon, and I'm reading from Philemon 1.7. He says, we have great joy and consolation. We seem to have lost Dr. Ronald. I think he's back. Sorry about that. Had some had some connection trouble there. Let's get right back into the study. Let's pray as we continue forward. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you have in store for us tonight. Pray and plead that you would sustain our connections and magnify your name in our midst. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we want to thank God for the book of Philemon. We were reading, I was reading to you from Philemon 1.7 and notice these powerful words. Philemon, Paul speaks about Philemon. He says, we have great joy and consolation in thy love. He says, we have great joy and comfort in thy love. Because the bowels of the saints, the inward parts of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Notice the way Paul is talking about Philemon. He has such high regard for Philemon as he tells him. He says, brother, the way you've been ministering to the brethren, they are being refreshed. Their inward parts are being refreshed. And that is such a blessing. And then Paul begins to talk about this very special subject he wants to present to his dearly beloved and fellow laborer, Philemon. Notice what Paul says. He says, I beseech thee for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Now I've heard two schools of thought on Paul's life. Some say he was married, but probably the wife passed away. Some say he was never married. In either case, we've not heard of a biological descendant Paul has had. And yet Paul speaks of Onesimus. And he says that, I have my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Now, it's, it's amazing then he's in captivity, and yet he speaks of one who is his son. Now, it's really interesting to note also, I believe that in Jewish thought, the individual, the person to whom you teach God's word becomes your son. It, it, almost like you become like a spiritual father to that person and address the, that, that person as, a, as your own child. So Paul noticed speaking about Onesimus and again speaking and, you know, of this, I mean, just this, this deep language that he employs in speaking at first about Philemon, speak, calling him his dearly beloved, calling him his fellow laborer, speaking about him and saying that I make mention of you always in my prayers, telling him that I am so blessed to hear and what comfort I receive when I hear how the saints are refreshed by your ministry. Now notice he employs another set of words to speak about his nearness, his intimacy with, with Onesimus, calls him as one who he has begotten in his bonds. In verse 11, Paul says, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. It's a really, really beautiful picture. He's writing to Philemon and he's saying, brother, Onesimus was unprofitable to thee in the past, but now he's profitable to you and he's profitable to me. This just further unveils, just further takes off the curtain to help us understand more about the story that Philemon also happens to know Onesimus because he says he was unprofitable to you in the past, but now profitable to thee and to me. 
In verse 12, we read, Whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels. Now, wait a minute. He's saying, I'm sending him to you again, which suggests Onesimus used to be with Philemon. And now Paul is pleading him, I'm sending him to you again, but with a request that you receive him as mine own bowels. In other words, as my own blood. I mean, such heavy language. Please accept him as, as my own blood. Verse 13, whom I would have retained with me that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. Now this helps us see he's met someone in, 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 in captivity. The name of the individual is Onesimus. And by whatever means this individual also was in bonds, he's done something wrong. He could have for some reason, been in this captivity. And we're told that Paul is speaking about him, but he's speaking about him so highly. In fact, in verse 13, he's putting him in the same position as Philemon when he says, I would have retained him with me so that he could have ministered to me in the bonds in your stead, in your place, in your behalf. He could have been your substitute. And I really would like you to you know, take a look at this because this is, I mean, this goes very, very deep. He continues in verse 15, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou should receive him forever. Now Paul says to Philemon, Philemon, brother, perhaps he left, he was with you, but he departed from you for a season so that you should receive him forever, so that you should receive him forever. It's, and it's just amazing. He continues, he says, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. He presents this plea to him. He says, brother, as you accept him, do not accept him now as a servant, which tells us that, Philem that Onesimus used to be with Philemon. He left, but when he was with Philemon, he used to be his servant. So now the picture sort of unfolds a little bit more for us and brings us to verse 16. And up until verse 16, we gain better understanding of what the story really is about. It's a story about a runaway servant. A runaway servant who has left his master has found Paul in captivity. And as Paul has ministered unto him and I've shared with him the good gospel message it has transformed the life of this man's servant so much so that paul considers him to be to keep him as equivalent in ministry to serve even in the as a substitute in the place of philemon and he's requesting he says brother accept him back but this time when you accept him don't accept him as a servant but really accept him as a brother, a brother beloved. Now, friends, when we hear those words, we do not want to separate. We can't divorce the thought that Philemon has gone through loss. Philemon has gone through pain. This, this, this servant of his just, just left. He's now a runaway servant. Paul is interceding for him. And he is saying, brother, please take him back. But don't take him back, in fact, as a servant this time, but take him back as a beloved brother. My friends, in the next three verses is where I would like your attention to come to because it sums up the gospel message. And as it sums up the gospel message, what I really like is the totality of the gospel message that's presented in the next three verses. Let's Let's roll through these three verses and then we will look at them again, you know, breaking them down by God's grace one bit after another. He says in verse 17, if thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. Verse 18, if he has wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on my account. Verse 19, I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Let's take a look at these three verses again. A runaway slave. 
who's caused hurt, who's caused pain, loss, found by the gospel message. And as the lost is found, the intercessor steps in and pleads for the lost who is now found and notice his plea, friends. Notice his plea. For friends, when we look at the story of Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus, when we look at the Paul, story of Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus, you would perhaps think that this is another story. And you're wondering, wait, why, why is this story, why are these 25 verses put in the Bible? I mean, why are they even there? What, what message do they have for us? Let's get right into the book of Hebrews. What is this in between? Why, why are these 25 verses as a pedestal to get into the understanding of that beautiful book of Hebrews? Friends, the following verses help us understand. The following verses help us understand deeper. And the Bible says that if you count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. Now friends, in the story that looks like is the story of Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus, it's really, really a blessing to see that what we really see is indeed a reflection, is indeed a reflection, not of Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus, but really the story of Jesus, God the Father, and us. We will see, friends, that in the picture of Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus, we actually see a beautiful picture, a complete picture of Jesus, God the Father, and us. So, friends, just as Paul was pleading with Philemon to take the one who has caused hurt and pain and loss, in a similar way, friends, in fact, in fact, into a much greater magnitude and deeper an appeal is the heart of Jesus, our heavenly Paul, pleading to a heavenly Philemon, the father, begging to him, saying, if you count me, therefore, a partner. Friends, that word partner is a really deep word. That word partner, it, 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 it goes deep because it, it's not just talking about co-workers. That's not what it means. It talks about keeping things in common, having things in common, having things you know, shared. He's talking about that if you consider me like yourself, not just a co-worker. He's saying to Philemon, if you consider me like yourself, if you consider me one, common as you, receive him as myself. And friends, couldn't that be a more apt appeal from the mouth of Jesus to the Father saying, Father, if you count me as yours, you know, as you look upon me as yours, not just a co-worker, but as one, as in I and the Father are one. He says, Father, if you consider me as one, I plead with you, can you receive the Onesimuses of this world as you receive myself? Now, friends, understand also, understand also that in the story, Paul is asking Philemon to accept a brother who's caused him hurt, who's caused him pain, who's caused him loss. And now, if I were to ask you the question, if I were to ask you the question, if someone has caused you deep pain, hurt, anguish, loss, if someone has really, really oppressed you, and it has been a deep, painful experience, is it easy that when you look at that person, you look at that person with joy. I mean, I forget about looking at that person. Perhaps even if the memory of that person comes to your mind, you get very uncomfortable. And here Paul is saying, brother, I'm sending him back. Don't accept him as a servant. Rather, accept him as a beloved brother. He elevates his appeal. He says, don't just accept him as a brother. I appeal to you, accept him the way you accept me. Now, from what we know about Paul and Philemon's relationship, we're finding out that they're really close. But the fact that Paul employs this word partner of that commonness, he is appealing to him that when you see this brother, you should really see me in this brother. 
And what an appeal, accept him, embrace him as you accept me. And, th and think about it, friends. If I were to tell you, when you next time see the person who's hurt you and caused you so much pain, embrace them as if you're embracing the, the person you love the most. Uh, perhaps, friends, that, that's, a, that's a tall order I'm asking you to embrace. And yet, brothers and sisters, we who are runaway servants, we who have caused God hurt and pain, it is an awesome appeal that comes to me from Philemon 1.17 that Jesus is appealing to the Father in a greater, much greater magnitude and pleading to the Father saying, Father, can you please accept the Onesimuses as myself? Can you please accept the brethren who have joined the final herald in studying the story tonight? And I know, Lord, they've run away from you. I know they've, they've turned their backs on you. I, I know, Lord God, in so many ways, they've broken God's law and have, and have, and have caused pain and hurt and loss to the kingdom of God. They've, they've done so much wrong. But Father, can I beg you? Can I plead with you to please accept them? And Father, accept them, not, 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 just, as, not just as those who, who've walked away, not just as transgressors. They've transgressed, and so, okay, we'll take them back. Not that kind of taking back, but take them back, Father, into the kingdom the way you take me. Oh, brothers and sisters, I don't know about you. I hear good news in Philemon 117 that Jesus is pleading to the Father that our acceptance should not just be of a sinner coming back home, but really of Jesus coming back home. In our faces, the appeal of Jesus is, Father, in their faces, I plead that you would see my face. Oh, friends, I don't know if you've seen a sweeter picture than this. The picture tells me that Jesus' plea ascends, it transcends human thought, comprehension, and, 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 and enveloping because we cannot perceive the power of what Jesus is, is, is pleading for as he stands in the heavenly sanctuary. As he pleads for you and I, his plea is, yes, Father, they've gone astray. Yes, they've, they've done evil. But can I plead with you that you would accept them as they come home? Please don't see in their faces their faults and failures, their ill doings, and they're walking away. And they're turning away from you and they're turning their backs on you. Don't look at them as runaway slaves. But can I plead with you in each of their faces? Would you see my face? Brothers and sisters, I think anybody tonight would agree. None of us, none of us deserve that in my face, the face of Jesus should be seen. And yet, that's the appeal of Jesus. That's the appeal of Jesus tonight. His appeal is that we would be accepted back. That we would be accepted back just as Jesus is accepted in heaven. Now, can you imagine, friends? Can you imagine the, the, the joy can you imagine the joy that, that roared in heaven as Jesus, the lamb that was slain, went and ascended and presented himself to heaven? What a, a thrill would have flooded the courts of heaven as Jesus was coming home. Oh, friends, it's going to be an awesome experience when you and I, by God's grace, by God's grace alone, just part the clouds and keep going higher until we stand in the expressed presence of the Father. As angels surround us and what joy would overtake us, what joy would overtake the heart, what an awesome sight it would be. And that's the plea of Jesus. I know, friends, we don't deserve that. And yet that's what Jesus is pleading for. But friends, you know, it would be so wrong for me to stop right here, say this is the appeal of Jesus and we should accept that appeal. We should rejoice in that appeal and go home. It doesn't stop there. You see, friends, that's, while that is a beautiful picture, that's not the complete picture. And I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to miss this, friends. What's sad is that there are many cheapened versions of the gospel. And I'd, and I'd like that by God's grace, all those versions are destroyed in our minds. And we have the complete picture of the gospel message. Jesus' appeal, an undeserving appeal that we would be accepted as Jesus. But then notice the following words. In verse 18, if he has wronged you or oweth thee ought, put that on my account. 
to brothers and sisters, we really want to understand what the appeal is about. It doesn't stop in verse 17. Paul continues, Paul recognizes, while I'm asking Philemon to accept Onesimus back, I have to consider, I have to realize that wrong has been done. I can't just ask Philemon to forget about it. That is not how it works. You don't just forget about it. Things have to be made right. And that's why I told you, I have not seen a picture as total, put together in just three verses like this in one place. It's beautiful. So follow us closely, friends. Paul's appeal, Brother Philemon, I realize there has been loss. A scholar who was reading points out, says that in Roman time, the time when this letter is written, for you to buy a servant, you'd have to spend about 500 denarii. To get you an idea, 500, one denarii was the wage, a daily wage. It was a daily wage. It was the wage for one day. So imagine you'd have to work for 500 days to earn 500 denarii. And in this case, you want to imagine that Philemon had spent 500 denarii to buy a servant. And as he spends 500 denarii, and now the servant goes away. He incurs the loss of 500 denarii, but not just that. If he has a business going and he obviously needs that manpower to replace that, he would have to spend another 500 to get another worker to do the work. So in terms of, I guess, say finances, he's had a loss about, say, at least, at least about a thousand denarii. Now think about it, friends. If, if, if you ask, if you ask the question, can Onesimus pay back the thousand denarii? Yes. How? By working for Philemon the next thousand days. And one day's wage being a denarii, he can make up for the loss he has incurred. But here's the thing. There's a reason why Paul is saying whatever he owes, whatever wrong he has done, I pray that you put that on my account. His stuff on my account. So that whatever he's done wrong looks as if, you know, it's me. So you put it all on me. And now this goes deeper because Paul recognizes, check this out. Paul recognizes that what Onesimus has done is far greater than a thousand denarii. And friends, we're not talking about money here. According to Roman law, according to Roman law, if you were a runaway slave and you were captured, if you were a runaway slave that was captured, the punishment was not repayment of money. The punishment was death. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Paul's appeal takes up the gospel picture. Paul's appeal takes up the gospel picture who recognizes Philemon has incurred a loss. And the punishment that's supposed to come on Onesimus is not just a few thousand denarii. The punishment that is to come upon Onesimus is death. And Paul is saying, whatever he owes, not just money, Philemon, I am willing to take the debt that rightfully is supposed to come on Onesimus. You see, brothers and sisters, that's the appeal of Jesus. And I really hope we recognize the gospel message here. Jesus is not just saying to the Father, Father, can we just forget about what they've done? Can we just forget? Yeah, they've done wrong, so what? Let's just overlook it. Let's, let's look over it. Friends, if the law could just be looked over, then Jesus' death makes no sense. It makes absolute no sense. If, if God's word could have been something that could have been just put aside, then Jesus' death make absolute no sense. Why did he have to die then? Why did he, if it could just be forgotten, if it could just be done away like that, why would he have to go to the cross? And Jesus' appeal to the Father, Father, I recognize a law has been transgressed. I recognize a punishment is due. I recognize a payment is rightfully in place. And Father, I plead with you. I plead with you that I am willing to take that. I'm willing to put that on my account, Father. Put that on my account. I'll pay for it, but I cannot have my children pay for it. Number one, could Onesimus have paid the thousand denarii? Yes, but could he have paid for death? No. Friends, if I said to you, this is how much you owe, perhaps you could work and strive and, 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 and beg and borrow and give back the money. But friends, how do you pay for debt? How do you pay for debt unless you die? The only way you settle the account is by dying. There's no other way you can settle the account. How do you settle that debt? 
listen to the story, the gospel goes deep. Father, don't just forget. Let's settle it right. Let's do it right. Let's do it right. Justice has to be served. So a payment is due, and Father, I'm willing to make that payment. I've got a profound thing that, friends, we'd like to, we'd like to look at tonight and go just a bit more deeper here. Jesus says, Jesus says, Father, whatever is to come upon the Onesimuses of this earth, I am willing to take that upon me. But he goes a step further, not just the payment of money. I am willing to take the death that is to come upon them. That's what they've transgressed. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. If you work in the factory called sin, the wage at the end of the month is death. Now, friends, let's take a look at what that means. When we look at the word death, Jesus was not talking about the first death. And I want us all to be on one page on this. When the Bible says the wages of sin is death, it wasn't talking about the first death, which in scripture is described as a sleep. Jesus says the little child, the little, the little damsel was, 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 they were worried, oh, she's dead. Jesus says, no, she's just asleep. People are laughing at him. And Lazarus, he says, you know, there he is, and he calls him back. And he looks at that as sleep. The only thing that's really described as death is the second death, the death to the wicked after the thousand years of the millennium. The death that comes upon the wicked, the death from which there is no coming back. Eternal death, in other words. Eternal death. Jesus says the wages of sin is death. Eternal death, eternal separation. And Jesus is saying, Father, I cannot have, I cannot have children, your children, eternally separated from you. I want to settle this. I want to settle the debt they have. And I want to settle it with my life. And I want to settle it with my life. Now, friends, here's the question. The question is, the question is, why Jesus? Why not anybody else? Why just Jesus? Why not anybody else? And that's, that's, that's the deep end of the question. Why not anybody else? We're told that angels fell at Jesus' feet saying, we will go. We will be the sacrifice, but you don't go. First off, that tells me how much love the angelic beings have for humanity. That's how much they loved us and loved Jesus enough to lay their lives down. But Jesus did not let them. He had to come. Some say because he created and he had to do it. Some say, oh, because the law was holy and, and, and the law was transgressed. And so a holy sacrifice had to begin. And that's true. Consider with me also, friends, that if you look at the sacrificial ceremony, as we just have looked at in the sanctuary, the command given for an acceptable offering is that the offering should be without blemish, no broken bones, no spots, no illness, none of that. A healthy, perfect lamb. Now, if you look at those requirements off the page, you also see that angels fit this requirement. They're without blemish. They've never sinned. They've never entertained sin. They've never fallen. They've never given into sin. They're spotless. They're unblemished. They're perfect. And yet, angels couldn't suffice. Because, friends, the, 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 the payment, the debt, the debt that was supposed to be paid was much greater. The debt was not just to present a, a, a spotless lamb. The debt was not just that, friends. The debt was a little bit more. The debt was a little bit more. And we want to find out, we want to find out what is that? What is that? What is that that was a little bit more? What is that that was a little bit more? You would remember, you would remember Jesus' words. You would remember Jesus' words on the cross. And when he's on the cross, one of his final words hanging there are those powerful words in the English, it is finished. It is finished. We, we hear those words. Now, it's interesting. It's interesting that when you look at that in the original Greek, a whole different meaning shines out. A whole different meaning shines out. The, the, word, the word in the Greek is special and something, something that really, really deserves our attention. The word in the Greek is really special. 
scholars, I guess, point out, saying that the word really meant something deep. The word was tetelestai. The Greek word, that was a very special word. The word that said, yes, it is finished, but in a very special sense. In a sense that when two people were going through a certain deal, when the deal was done, both would shake hands and say, Tetelestai, the deal is done. It's settled. There were times when, when you would buy and purchase a land. And when the deed of sale was done and everything, you would shake hands and say, Tetelestai, the deal is done. The, the price is paid. The debt is settled. It is, it is settled. And you wonder, why would Jesus employ, why would Jesus employ these words? Why would Jesus employ these business transactional language on the cross as a choice for one of his final words? Why would he use these words to seal up his life and saying, it is finished. The deal is done. The debt is settled. Transactional terms, because he's pointing out something more, not just a perfect, spotless, unblemished, but there was something else that was involved. There was another payment that was involved because the wages of sin is death, eternal debt. Now think about it, friends. How do you settle a debt? Paul, let's take, let's take Philemon's example. In Philemon's example, Onesimus owed him, let's say, roughly a thousand denarii. The way Onesimus settles that debt is to pay back the thousand denarii. As long as he has the thousand denarii, he can pay back and settle the account. But the problem was what he owed was debt. What we owe, brothers and sisters, is eternal debt. How do we settle for it? The only way you settle it is by eternally dying. The only way you can get out of it is by someone else making the payment. And the question is, how does someone else make the payment? Because uh, are, are we saying we let someone else eternally die? How, how do I really escape the punishment of eternal death? Jesus steps in and he says, I would do it. Because friends, pay attention. Like I said, if you owe a thousand denarii, the way you settle the debt of a thousand denarii is by paying the thousand denarii. But when the debt you owe is eternal debt, you need to have eternal life to be able to settle that debt. And that's not something anybody has. I think Timothy puts it so beautifully. He alone is immortal. He is immortal. Cannot die. Now you would say, yes, but angels are also immortal. But realize that angels only experience the perpetuity of life as sourced from Jesus. They are not innately immortal. When Paul says, this mortal will put on immortality, we will not be innately immortal, friends. For if we are innately immortal, why would we still go back to the tree of life? As we read in the book of Revelation, we again go back to the tree of life. We still eat of it. And what was the purpose of the tree of life? Genesis 3 tells us to eat and to live forever. Our perpetuity, our continuance of life is not of us. It will always be of the Lord, my friends. He alone. He is life. In him is life unborrowed. He has eternal life. Only he can settle the debt. Brothers and sisters, do you realize tonight, if Jesus would not have stepped in and taken the punishment and taken it upon himself to settle the debt, you and I would have been forever lost. Angels would have come and died for us, and that would be a great gesture of showing how much they love us, but that would not have changed a thing. That would not have settled the debt because they don't have what it takes to settle the debt. Friends, it is because of Jesus. It is because of the love of Jesus. It's because of the sacrifice of Jesus. It's because of the selfless, selfless lamb who was willing to put eternal life on the line and say, I will settle the debt because I know they can't. They don't have it in them. I'll step in and do it for them. Friends, I'd like you to take a look at that a bit more complete picture. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. The, while this is beautiful, Jesus says, accept them as myself, but not just a forgetting away of sins, but, but let's make it right. Lord, I am willing to pay the price. Now, this is a beautiful picture. This is an awesome picture. And yet, friends, this is not the complete picture. 
This is a beautiful picture. And, and by the way, friends, this is the gospel picture probably for many a Christian and for many a churches. And yet this is not the complete gospel picture. I'd really like us to embrace that tonight. While it's powerful that Jesus is saying, please accept them as I am. When you see them, see my face in their faces. That's powerful. That's beautiful. But Jesus is elevating that. He's saying, whatever they've wronged, put it on my account. I am willing to pay it. That's beautiful. So Jesus paid the price. Jesus paid it all on the cross. But I'd like you to notice something else. I'd like you to notice something else. What did he... What did he say to the world in doing this? What was he really saying? We want to talk about that. And I want to present that to you as the final thought. I want to seal it up with that thought. It is beautiful. But friends, take a look at this. Don't miss this. Really don't miss it. This is powerful. Notice something else Paul is saying in Philemon 118. Whatever they, whatever Onesimus owes thee, put it on my account. Wait a minute. What? Put it on my account. He says even further in verse 19, I, Paul, have written it with my hand. I guess they say that for, for other letters, he probably, there was a scribe who would write down and Paul would dictate. But this one, Paul says, I'm writing it with my own hand. I will repay it. I will repay it. I assure you, Philemon, I will repay it. So put it on my account. But wait, you think, uh, and, and you know, I, I just want to put myself in Onesimus' shoes. As he reads this letter, he's like, what, Brother Paul, what are you writing? Father, you, you, are, you are like my spiritual father, but this is too much. I mean, wait, how can you? I don't deserve this. And, I've, and friends, I, I really hope we put ourselves in Onesimus' shoes because we indeed are in Onesimus' shoes. Have you ever paused to ask yourself, do I even deserve the sacrifice of Jesus? Do I deserve the fact that he would lay down his eternal life on the line for me? To save me from eternal death? Who am I? Do I deserve that? Who is man, Lord, that you should be mindful of him? What have I done that you would shine your face upon me? But Jesus shocks you. Jesus shocks you. Paul shocks Onesimus when he says, when he says, when he's writing to Philip, brother, whatever he owes you, what, and whatever that is, just put it on my account. But wait a second, if it's, if it's your account, his wrongdoing, your account, wait, but, but wait, that would look like it's your wrong, it's your wrong, that would look like this is your evil, but wait, it's like, but no, from this day on, it's like, whatever he's done wrong, it, it will be on my account, whatever loss he's incurred, it would be like, it would look like it's mine, so it's like, in a way, we're on the same account, we're on a joint account. Look at what Paul is saying. Friends, I'm, I'm trying to finish up the complete picture of the gospel. Not just a for, don't just forget away whatever they've done. No, I, the reason why I'm saying, Father, they should be a forgetting away, they were doing away, is because I'm going to make it right. I will pay the price. Let's do it right. I will pay the price. But Father, I have one more plea. The, the gospel story is not complete. I have one more plea. And that is, that is I want them to be on my account. I want them, the wrongs that done, I want it to be on my account. Father, I want us to be on the same account. Ah, perhaps, perhaps this doesn't get through. So let me give you an illustration. If you can remember, if you can think of probably the richest man in India or whatever country you're joining from, the richest person you know from your country. And imagine that richest person steps in through your doors. And he steps in through your doors tonight and says, now here I am. Um, I have an offer for you. I've got, in fact, an offer for you. And the offer is that I am willing to pay all your debts tonight. How many of you? Raise your hands. And yes, I can't see you, but it would be nice if you still raise your hands and say, I'd like my debts to be paid. I, I have some stuff I'd like to be settled in my life. I mean, it's, it's really, it's really long standing and, I, and it would be so nice. What a relief I would have if some debts were settled. And he says, yeah, fine. Whatever, however amount it is, however big it is, I'm willing to make the payment, I'll settle it for you. And what joy and peace you sleep soundly tonight. But before he leaves, he says, by the way, I've got one more offer. 
and you can choose between the two, whatever you'd like. The other offer is, by the way, would you like to be on a joint account with me? So I've got two offers for you. Either I can pay all your debt. The other offer is, would you like to be on the same account as I am? How about that? I mean, does, does that sound suitable to you? And perhaps now, when I've given you the illustration of the richest man, I hope this now makes more of an impact. As we think about you know, money, I guess it really comes through. And wait a minute, this richest person in India is saying, from today, you and I will share the same account. You know what that means, right? That means from this day on, whatever country you're from, there are not, there's not one richest person, there are two richest people in the country tonight because you and that individual share the same account. You share the same account. Dear brothers and sisters, I'd really like you to know this is the message of the cross. And I'm repeating this. We've come through this and I want to go back here. This is the complete picture of the gospel. I'm reading to you from 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. Notice what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That's Jesus. Who knew no sin. He took upon sin. He became sin, the Bible says, to be sin for us who knew no sin. He took up every sin and every guilt committed since Adam. He took it upon himself. Identified himself. We studied yesterday. Took upon sinful flesh. Serpent on the cross. A goat on the day of atonement. He took up those images. We have made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, but then he continues. He didn't stop there. He's saying the reason why I took all that sin, who knew no sin, so that we, you and I, brothers and sisters, might be made the righteousness of God in him. I took all your sin so that you may take all of my righteousness. I took all your dirt so that you take all my cleansing. I have taken all your sin. The plea is that you take all my righteousness. And friends, that's the complete picture. The complete picture is not just that, Lord, just accept them. And regardless of what that, just, just accept them. No, Lord, I'm going to make it right. I'm going to settle them. I'm going to fill them. And, 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 and Father, what will help you, what will enable us to take them in is because when, when the exchange happens, when the trade takes place, all their sin is taken, I will pay for it. And in exchange, they will take all my righteousness. Dear brothers and sisters, we talk about the cross. Messages are preached about the cross. We say that we believe in the message of the cross. We say that we embrace the cross, the cross of Jesus. He's paid the sacrifice. We respect and honor that sacrifice. My question, friends, is have you made the trade tonight? Have you made the trade of giving up your sin and taking all his righteousness? Because the reality is, friends, if you've not taken all his righteousness, you've never accepted the complete gospel. And friends, what's not complete is not the gospel at all. Truth is, friends, the cross we talk about so much and sing songs about, we have not accepted the cross if we've not accepted the offer of the cross. The offer of the cross was not just that I'm coming to make the payment. No, the offer of the cross was from this day, would you like to be on my account? From this day, would you like to be on my account? I'm not just coming to pay the debt. I am making sure, check this out, friend, check this out. Paul knew Onesimus's condition. He knew I could pay his debt. That's easy. But the thing is, Onesimus is poor and he'll go back into debt. How can I save him? The way I save him, I put him on my account so that he is never poor again. He's rich. He is rich. He is rich. And today, my brothers and sisters, the riches of righteousness are awaiting you. Today, Jesus wants you to be on the same righteousness account as Jesus. So that no matter how dark your sin is, in receiving the brightness of his righteousness, you can shine as Jesus and see him and be pure as he is. You can experience the sanctified life. You can walk down the aisle and say, Jesus, I'm forever yours. Jesus, I'm forever yours. Do you want to be on that account, friends? That's my question tonight. Do you really want to accept the offer of the cross? 
this is the complete picture. Do not lessen this picture. Do not subtract from this picture. Don't crop this picture out. The complete wide angle panoramic shot of the gospel is that he takes your sins. He pays the price so that you take all his righteousness. And that's the complete shot. That's the complete picture. That's the message God would like you to receive tonight. Because you're precious to him. Not because we're acting precious, friends. Listen to me very carefully. Not because we're acting precious. Not because we're really righteous and living a really upward life, but because he loves us. Oh, friends, you've got to listen to me. Because he loves us. I want to close with this final thought, and I, I just had to put this in because the way this author puts it is just stunning. Listen to these final words as we close. Some of these last final words. In the book, Upward Look, you read the following words. Justice asked for the sufferings of a man. Friends, justice demanded. The law is broken. The wages of sin is death. Who broke the law? Man. Justice demanded man should suffer. Man has to die. Man's done this. He's got to pay for it. The wages of sin is death. Who works has to die. He has to suffer. Man has to suffer for what man has done. But we're told that Christ steps in. He steps into the paradigm and he says, equal with God. And because I'm equal with God, I will pay. Yes, I know. I know justice. Justice demands the sufferings of man. I will give sufferings. Just that I won't pay. Listen to me carefully, friends. Jesus says, but I won't pay. I know there is a debt. I know there is a loss. I know there's a payment that's due, but the payment I know is the suffering of man, but I am not going to pay it with the suffering of man. I am going to up the payment and I am going to pay it with the sufferings of God. Ah, oh, friends, I don't know if you're there. I don't know if you're really embracing this tonight. Jesus says, I know justice demands that man should suffer, but I demand that I will pay it with the sufferings of a God. Let me bring it home to you, friends. Let me bring it home to you. You go out. You go to a showroom. You look at a vehicle. You really like it. You ask the owner of the shop, I really like this vehicle and I want to purchase it. The owner says, well and good, let's get to the paperwork. You ask, by the way, how much does it cost? You say, all right, it, it, it's, gonna, it's going to cost you 500,000. 500,000, that's it? I want to let you know, th that's the price you put on this car? I want to let you know how valuable this car is. This car is so valuable that I'd pay 5 million for this. You said 500,000, I'm going to pay for it with 5 million. Here you go, 5 million. But wait, what's demanded is only 500,000. I know that that's what's demanded, but I want to let you know how, what is the value in my eyes for this vehicle? I pay for it with 5 million because that's what it means to me. Just as demanded, man should suffer. Jesus came into the picture. He says, let me show the universe how much man means to me. I'll pay for him with the sufferings of God. I know that that's not what's demanded. What, well, what is demanded is the sufferings of man. Man should suffer and let's get done with this picture. But Jesus says, no, I want to not the world know. I want to let the universe know. Every time people look at humanity, they should know how much they meant to me. I paid for them with my sufferings. God will suffer. God will suffer. God will suffer in the place of man because that's how much they mean to me. I'll pay more. I'll pay more. I know it's demanded for their suffering, but I'll pay more. I'll pay more to let you know, my friend, who looks down upon himself tonight, to let you know who question your belonging in the kingdom of God, to let you know who doubt God's forgiveness. I want to let you know what you mean to me. I'll pay more. I have paid more. I have paid more for you so that you remember and not a being in the universe can point a finger at you and put you down because Jesus has paid more for you. Jesus has paid more for you. The complete picture. The complete picture. Brothers and sisters, what do you do with such a love? What do you do 
with such a love? That's my question tonight. What do you do with such love that lets you know this is how much I love you? I'll pay more. Will you take it? Will you take it tonight, my friend? I plead with you, my sister, would you take it? My young friend, would you take it? Brother, would you take it? I'll take all your sins. I'll pay more to settle the debt. I want you to take all my righteousness. Join me on my account. As righteous as I am, that's how righteous I want you to be. Take it. Take it tonight. Go home with this complete picture and tell the world about the God who paid more. The God who paid more. If that's you, if that's you in need of that exchange, if that's you tired of your debt, look, look to the riches of righteousness that are being offered to you. Look, because that offer is not of some character. That offer is of a person. That person, that individual, he is righteousness. It is in Jesus. Jesus is our righteousness. Christ, our righteousness. I invite him tonight, friends. Invite him to take over your life. Invite him to live in you, to walk in you, to defeat sin in you so that you shine and shine for the glory of God. That you no longer live, but Christ who lives in you. If that's you, would you kneel with me, brother, if you're able? Would you kneel with me, sister, if you're able? Whatever you are, whatever condition, would you kneel with me if you're able as we pray together? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you. How great is your love. Thank you for Jesus who paid it all and more. Who paid it all and more to let us know so that we never doubt because we doubt, Lord. We doubt. He settled all doubts by saying, look at my sacrifice. I've paid for you with more. Don't ever doubt my love for you. I want to speak, Lord, to someone tonight. I pray that you speak to someone tonight. I pray that your spirit stirs someone's heart tonight. I pray that you tear down the walls in someone's life tonight. Someone is held back by doubt and fear and uncertainty. Questions, I don't think God will accept me. Father, tear down the walls. And let your people know God has paid more. How? How can he love you less? How can he love you less? Help us, Father. Thank you. Thank you for standing in the gap, for pleading for us to be accepted, that in our face, the face of Jesus would shine, that our debts would be canceled, that we would live in riches, the riches of righteousness. That we would live for you, not for ourselves. That we would live for Jesus forever and evermore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name.